The purpose of this video is to get us outside the United States context a little bit and look at two important international bodies and look at how they measure poverty. The first organization that we're going to look at today is the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. This is a pretty influential international group of 35 countries, most of which are um, highly developed and wealthy. This organization was started in 1961 primarily to promote economic growth and trade. Um, it has grown over the years and has gotten some new members. Its mission is to promote policies that will improve the economic and social well-being of people around the world, not just in its member countries. The OECD has a research function. They monitor and analyze social and economic data from all of the different member countries, and they disseminate reports and projections um, and comparisons they also provide a forum where countries can collaboratively uh, do peer review on other countries' policies and initiatives. And sometimes formal agreements or treaties between countries will result from an initiative that they participated in through the OECD, but the organization's primary goal is not to um, be a treaty organization, but to be more of a research organization. Here is a map of the member countries of the OECD. And as you can see, we're basically looking at the global north um, with Chile and Australia there being the outliers. Um, but the middle shade of green there, you can, you can see there are several countries that have started talks to join the OECD or have promised to start talks to join the OECD, most notably Russia. And then in the lightest shade of green here, you can see that um, there are countries that have expressed an interest in joining the OECD, but have not started talks to do so. And those countries, you can see Argentina, Peru, we may see some movement um, into the global south as the OECD continues to grow and develop, but right now still predominantly made up of countries in the global north. The way in which the OECD measures poverty is going to be pretty familiar in several, several respects. It, it, they still use a threshold approach. They still use a threshold that is for households, not for individuals. And it is a single indicator approach. It is focused solely on income. However, their income their income concept is a concept called disposable income. And it's closer to the supplemental poverty measures concept of household resources, but not identical to it. It is a post tax and transfer concept of income, but non cash in kind benefit programs would not be counted in disposable income cash transfers, things like social security payments or, you know, tax credits, things like that would be counted in disposable income. So it's close but not identical to the concept of household resources. But the major way in which the OECD's poverty measurement is different from our official poverty measure in the United States is that the threshold for poverty is totally relative. It is not absolute. And their threshold is households with 50% or less of the median household income in the member country. So then they take their thresholds and they use a standardized equivalence scale to make adjustments for households of different sizes and compositions. So if we place the OECD's poverty measurement onto our conceptual map here of the uh, possible approaches to measuring poverty, we can see that um, it's just like the OPM except in the threshold column. Its threshold is completely relative. So if median incomes in a country rise tremendously, let's say things are going very well in that country, um, that threshold will float 50% of median. So that threshold will rise with it. If we wanted to look at poverty in the United States through the OECD's framework, um, we would learn something pretty interesting. So 
The OECD gets its data from the member countries. It doesn't conduct surveys of its own. And in the United States, the Census Bureau is the designated agency to report income and poverty data. And they have to make several adjustments before they do so, however. So they have to report disposable income because that's the concept that the OECD uses. So they have to calculate incomes post tax and transfers. And again, they have to pull out um, any, any data about non-cash in kind benefits. And then the OECD uses a slightly different scale for adjusting for larger and smaller households than the Census Bureau does, so they have to adjust their equivalent scale. But almost every year when the official report on poverty comes out from the Census Bureau, you can find, usually way back toward the end, this little nugget. If we in the United States measured poverty the way the OECD measures poverty, our poverty rate would be about 22.9%. So much, much higher. Uh, in 2015, our poverty rate was 13.5%. And um, you can see here, this is pulled from the 2014 report. We had a poverty rate of 14.8%. So it would be much, much higher if we measured poverty, income poverty, the way the OECD does. Now, the OECD also monitors a portfolio besides just income poverty. They monitor a portfolio of other indicators that are related to poverty and inequality. And we're going to look at the OECD's database on this in class. The second major international organization that we're going to look at for today is the European Union. The European Union has 28 member countries. It started as primarily an economic community to facilitate um, trade and growth and so on after the, the Second World War. But since that time, the European Union has branched out and now they do work in, in pretty much every policy area you can think of. Climate policy, health policy, security policy, migration policy, pretty much everything. They changed their name from the European Economic Community to the European Union in 1993. The Union itself is based on treaties that all of the member countries have with each other. And in 2012, the European Union was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. If you can you know, remember from history class how many wars have been fought on European territory over the centuries, um, it's a lot. And since there has been this at first European Economic Community, later the EU, um, at least Western Europe has been pretty peaceful. So that's why they were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And their stated goal, it's pretty lofty, is peace, stability, and prosperity across Europe. So here's a map of the EU member states, along with their two-letter country codes. And these are going to be really important for you to know in class, uh, or to have handy in class, because we're going to be looking at a bunch of data for the European Union member states, MS. So Germany, not what you think it might be. It's actually two-letter two country code is DE, reflecting its German name. And some of the others are a little bit less intuitive. Um, but as you can see, there's some interesting outliers. Norway and Switzerland are not formal members of the EU. They just like to be independent. They're not joiners. They don't like to join clubs. Um, but nor both Norway and Switzerland have agreements to basically play along with most EU policy areas. Um, Switzerland uses the euro. I'm pretty sure Norway uses the euro too. I'm not sure. But um, they are in, in very many ways part of the life of the EU, even though they aren't formal members. And you can also see here that there are several candidate countries down in the Balkans area. Um, these are countries that have applied to join the EU, and they are Albania, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Kosovo. Um, Turkey would very much like to join the EU and is trying very hard to join the EU. Um, there are questions as to whether Turkey's government is sufficiently secular. 
um, to join the EU. This is a big, big principle of the EU is that government should be completely secular. So stay tuned as to what happens with Turkey. Now, every year, a bunch of EU statisticians get together, and you should visit their website. It's so totally awesome. It's called Eurostat.com, and they have so much data on there. If you're a real nerd like me, go check it out. Um, they put together this thing called the Social Protection Performance Monitor Dashboard. And they're, they prepare this for the members of the Social Protection Committee, which is... Um, a big, powerful committee in the EU that gives advice to the social affairs ministers in each member state. And social protection is basically EU parlance for welfare, right? For social well-being. And their goal in preparing this performance monitor dashboard is to give members of this committee a ton of information in a very short space. So because it's a dashboard, they, they, like the OECD, use a portfolio approach. They, they have 25 different indicators for each member country. And, but the centerpiece, the, the statistic that is at the centerpiece of this whole portfolio of, of 25 plus indicators is always a statistic called AROPE, which stands for at risk of poverty or social exclusion. So you should see in your mind a little red light go on here. We have a totally new concept introduced into the poverty discourse, and that is the concept of social exclusion. Now, a rope as a statistic is calculated in this way. You add together all the people who are in households that are at risk of poverty, and we'll talk about the definition of that one, or a ROP, not a rope, but a ROP. And then you add in all of the people who belong to households with very low work intensity, or VLWI. And then you add in all the people who are severely materially deprived, or SMD. People who are in households who are severely materially deprived, and we'll talk about what that means. Then you take all that, add it together, and divide by the total population of the member state and you get the AROPE rate for that country. Now the overall AROPE rate in the whole EU in 2014 was right about a quarter, 24.4%. But there's considerable variation from country to country. The high on AROPE in 2014 was in Romania and Bulgaria at 40% of the population AROPE, and the low was in the Czech Republic. Um, where 14.8 percent of the population were a rope. So the first of the three components of the a rope statistic is a simple income poverty measure, and a ROP is the percentage of people who are in households with disposable income. Again, it's the same income concept as the OECD post tax and transfer below 60% of the median household income in the member state. So it's exactly the same as the OECD's income poverty measure, except that they set the threshold 10 percentiles higher. So if we wanted to put a ROP on our conceptual map here of possible approaches to poverty measurement, it would be exactly the same as the OECD. It's a relative threshold. It's just a little bit higher than the OECD's, 60% of the median. And that is a relative threshold because, again, if medians rise, that threshold is going to float with it. The second of the three components of a rope is very low work intensity. And gradually, the EU has been shifting its terminology from very low work intensity to quasi-jobless households. I think in the next few years, we'll see their policy terminology completely shift over to talking about quasi-jobless households. But for now, they still call it VLWI. And to calculate VLWI, you get the percentage of people who are under 60 years old, so 0 to 59 who live in households where the working age adults, that is those 18 to 59, 
all together cumulatively work 20% or less of their maximum work intensity. Now, it's important to note that full-time students in the 18 to 24 age range are completely excluded before this calculation is done. So students would not throw this number off at all. So what you do is you take a household and you take all of the months worked by all the non-student adult members of the household, 18 to 59. And you do this in full-time equivalent terms, full FTE, full-time equivalency. So if all the working age members of the household together worked um, six months at half-time, then they would be credited with three months of FTE work. If they worked all together 12 months at quarter-time, then they would have three months of FTE work among them. And then you divide that by the maximum months that all of those non-student working age adult household members could have worked. And they use the standard for full-time work that is prevalent in each country. So some countries consider 35 hours a week to be full-time work. Um, other countries, it's even less than that. Some countries, it's 40 hours. So they, they use the standard for full-time work that is valid in each country. And you calculate that out. And if the result of that division problem right there is 0.2 or less, then that household is VLWI. Everyone in that household is VLWI. So if we wanted to put this second of the three components of a rope onto our map here, um, it is a single indicator approach. The threshold of VLWI is absolute. It's 20% of full time. If you're, if you're, all the adults in your household together are working 20% uh, or less of a full time workload, um, there's nothing relative about that. That's an absolute threshold. But the indicator that's being pointed at with VLWI is the first time we've seen this category of capabilities crop up. The reason that VLWI is a whole separate criteria for AROPE and not just income is because work is seen as a very important human capability. It's something that, something very central that human beings um, can do is to be workers. And to be excluded, this is one of the, this is, this and SMD, VLWI and SMD are the two exclusion indicators, social exclusion indicators. There's a ROP and then the other two are these social exclusion indicators. The reason that very low work intensity is of such concern to the EU is because being excluded from work is to have a very important human capability impaired. It may also be about having a very low income, but more importantly, it's about having a central capability impaired. So think about it. What else do you get from working besides a paycheck, besides income? Well, maybe you get a sense of self-esteem. Maybe you get a sense of purpose. Maybe you get challenges and lifelong learning. Maybe you get a social network. Maybe you get friends. Maybe um, you have get some mental health benefits from um, working. And this is the reason that very low work intensity is so concerning to the EU, because it means losing out on all those things. In addition to losing out on income, it's a way of being excluded from very important things that people get through work. Now, the third of the three components of a rope is severe material deprivation. Now, the EU, like the United States, does a lot of household surveys in all of its member countries. And they have a thing that's called the Survey on Income and Living Conditions, or the SILK. And one of the questions on the SILK is, which of these following nine items could your household not afford, even if you wanted to? And the reason that they phrase the question in that way is to control for um, people who don't have things just because they don't want them. Um, think about number eight on this list, a car. A lot of Europeans don't have cars, especially Europeans who live in the great cities of Europe, you know, Paris, Munich, 
Um, they just choose not to have a car. But because the question is worded the way it is, then they would not be throwing off the numbers. So the items on this list go from sort of the very, very serious, um, not being able to afford to pay your rent or mortgage or utility bills, not being able to keep your home adequately warm, and they do also add cool um, in some countries where that's the primary concern, um, not being able to afford to face unexpected expenses. And the interviewers on this question usually put a specific amount on that, and they take the average household monthly income, and whatever a tenth of that is, they'll they'll use whatever a tenth of that is for that country. They'll they'll use that. So they'll say, if you had unexpected expenses of you know two hundred euros or something like that, um, would you be able to afford that? Um, not being able to afford to eat meat or Proteins, they do include vegetarian alternatives in the in the wording of the question. Not being able to afford to eat meat or proteins regularly, which they do specify as every second day. And then, you know, as you move through the list, it becomes a little bit different. So not being able to afford to go on a seven-day holiday. Um, if you know any Europeans, they're very serious about vacations. Um, so to not be able to go on a one-week holiday is a sign of serious material deprivation for Europeans. Most Europeans have six to eight weeks of vacation each year anyway, so not being able to go on a one-week holiday is a very serious matter. Um, not being able to afford a television set, not being able to afford a washing machine, not being able to afford a car, and not being able to afford a telephone. Again, even if you wanted to. So um, if we wanted to put SMD as, an, as a measurement onto our map here, there's one way of looking at SMD where it's looking at a single indicator, and that single indicator is specific deprivations, specific things you don't have. Um, but there's another way of looking at SMD where, because there's this list of nine things, and while they, the list, the, the, the nine things are all specific deprivations, they have to do with different things, right? The one week vacation may point to standard of living. Um, consumption is certainly in the mix. Facing un, unexpected expenses. Um, capabilities are on the list, things that people aren't able to do, you know, take vacations, um, as well as specific things you don't have, like a telephone and a washing machine. Um, but either way you want to look at SMD, the threshold is absolute. It's just four out of nine. Um, and if the household answers yes for nine out of nine, there is no there is no gradation on that. It's just severe material deprivation either way. But if it's three out of nine, they're not SMD, so that is an absolute threshold. There's nothing relative about that. But if we look at all three components of AROPE all together, we can see that AROPE is probably the broadest approach to poverty measurement that we have seen yet. So there, it has multiple indicators. Standard of living is in the mix. Income is definitely in the mix with a ROP. Um, consumption, uh, the entire list of SMD um, items is really a, sort of a, cons a list of con consumption categories, not being able to eat meat and so on. Um, capabilities are in the mix, and also specific deprivations um, are in the mix. So we've got at least five indicators in this approach to poverty measurement. And the thresholds are mixed. The AROP threshold is relative, and the VLWI and the SMD thresholds are absolute. So it is a multiple indicator mixed threshold approach to poverty measurement. Now, I said that a rope is um, the centerpiece of this report that these statisticians put together. Um, of all the households who are AROPE, 70% of them are in AROPE because of the income category. So um, the lion's share of people who are in the AROPE category are there because their incomes are 60% of the median or below. And then smaller percentages are in the AROPE category because they're severely materially deprived or because they have very low work intensity. And some households, of course, would have two or even three, but if you have even one, then you're in the basket of AROPE. The um, other 
indicators that are on this giant portfolio dashboard that the statisticians put together uh, include all kinds of interesting things. They measure persistent AROP. So this is kind of like our chronic poverty, 48 consecutive months in poverty, except it's not quite so stringent. Um, persistent AROP is a household that is 60% of median income or below in the current year and in two of the three prior years. So it's a little more wiggle room in there. Um, they measure an 80-20 ratio, which is a way of measuring income inequality. We'll learn more about that when we study ways to measure inequality. They study child poverty and child social exclusion. They look at the impact of redistribution on AROP rates. So pre-redistribution, post-redistribution, does income poverty go up or down? Um, they look at in-work poverty, how many people are working and still 60% of median income or below. They look at long-term unemployment rates. Um, they have a category that they call early school leavers, which is a much nicer name for what we tend to call it in United States policy parlance, um, which would be dropouts. Um, they look at youth unemployment rates. They look at elderly unemployment rates. They look at... Um, this category called NEET, N-E-E-T, which, again, is a much nicer term. In the United States policy circles, we tend to refer to these people as disconnected youth. These are people 18 to 24 years of age who are not in education, employment, or training, N-E-E-T. Um, not in school and not in work. And they, they have a life expectancy criteria in here, how many healthy life years you're projected to have at 65 years old. They look at um, proportions of the population that have severe housing cost burdens, and they look at changes across time in gross household disposable income. So these members of the Social Protection Committee have this giant dashboard full of data, the centerpiece of which is AROPE, but all of these other things are also on there too. And we're going to look at that um, dashboard in class. Now the European Union's goal in its current strategic plan, which is called Europe 2020, catchy, um, was to reduce the number of people at risk of poverty or, or social exclusion by 20 million by the year 2020. And this target was set in 2010. And you may be interested to know that they are not currently on track to meet this target. Um, 20 million fewer people in AROPE by 2020. And the primary reason they're not on target is because of the global financial crisis. And there has been so much recovery work to do um, after that. And they only have three years left. Um, before 2020, but that was that was their target.